Um, thanks to the organizers for setting up this uh, conference, and uh, also thanks to Marie for collaborating with me on this. Uh, unfortunately, our collaboration was pretty short because she didn't really have much to do for reasons that you'll uh, see in a minute, but it was still fun working with her. So this is the outline of my talk. I'll first show you an example that you might find interesting or surprising, and then there will be an explanation for why, why it actually should make sense. Um, if you accept all that, I'll show you a whole bunch of more examples. Um, there's a little bit here on uh, some work we did on a Cray supercomputer. And then at the end, I'll take a stab at uh, PDs on graphs. So suppose someone were to come up, with you, come up to you with this domain that consists of two intersecting squares, and they asked you to solve the Poisson equation on this domain. I think it, probably your first reaction would be to say that, well, that domain is not differentiable, and I don't, I don't think I can do that. But if they insisted that you think about it, um, you might sit down and write down this solution to this problem, because you would note that it's, it satisfies all the boundary conditions. There's a Dirichlet condition here, and there's Neumann conditions on all the other edges. And it satisfies the Poisson equation. If you consider these two squares independently, the Poisson equation is satisfied on each of them. And it just happens to kind of agree along the intersection line. So it makes, it's plausible that this might be the solution to this problem on some sort of mechanical level. But you're not sure, so you ask your, uh, you ask your friend who knows all about these things. Um, this is how you communicate with your friend. Um, the person asking you this originally gave you, it was kind enough to give you a conforming mesh of the domain, which you put in there. You might want to refine it a few times. But every, every other part of this code should look very familiar to everyone here. You probably could uh, write this in your sleep at this point. Um, and, but just note that the error here is the infinity norm of the solution vector. But otherwise, it's just standard Python code. And your friend thinks about it for about two seconds. Forward? No. Not going forward. Down? Yeah. Oh, uh, there it goes. Yeah. And agrees with you that this is, in fact, the solution. So this is the textbook uh, convergence test. Um, norm of the residual for Lagrange elements of different order converging at exactly the right rate. Um, actually, this is very similar. After I did this, this is very similar to the same problem in the Dolphin benchmark uh, repo. So your friend you know, agrees with you. You think it's reasonable, but you still, for some reason, need a third opinion. So you send an email to Marie. And this is what Marie says. Um, she says, Fenix, since version 1.2, around 2012 or 2013, has supported manifolds. Um, the, the mapping to the reference element in manifolds is not rectangular because of the difference in the dimension of the, the topological and geometrical dimensions. That's not an issue. And these measures are um, defined in, in the way that you intuitively would want them to to be defined w without respect to the fact that there's an embedding. So for, for two dimensions, this is you know, an, an area, and these are um, one-dimensional measures. And you know, the orientability of the manifold is not an issue for the machinery, right? Um, two intersecting planes are not a manifold, right? Because there's no tangent space along the intersection line. Um, if you search around, you can find things called branched manifolds um, in the literature. They've been around since about the 1950s. They're not the same as these things because even though they, they look like intersecting manifolds, but they're actually differentiable at the, at the intersection points. And they come up in control theory, but these aren't them. right? So we're not on a manifold. So for lack of a better term, I'm calling all of these things non-manifolds, even though that's a kind of a terrible term. But it's meant to imply that as far as Phoenix, because it's not a manifold, but as far as Phoenix is concerned, it might as well be a manifold. But it might as, might as well be a manifold is, maybe I should have called it that. It's, it's 
better than non-manifold. Um, the machinery inside of Phoenix, if you sit down and think about this, actually it makes sense, right? Because all of the operations, mechanically all of the operations you need to do to construct like a stiffness matrix or a mass matrix are all cell-wise operations. So the fact that a cell, the fact that a vertex like this one shares cells that are along different sub-manifolds, if you want to call them that, shouldn't make any difference, right? You can still define, if you want to think about linear Lagrange elements, you can still write down what a little hat function would, would look like for that vertex. And it's fine. The only thing that breaks, um, that potentially breaks according to Marie is if you wanted to do like an integration over some interior facets that were along this intersection line where edges have more than one cell neighbor. I have, actually haven't tried that in any of the experience, experiments I've done, so I can't really verify that it breaks. But uh, according to Marie, there's a restriction in the code that those interior edges have only two triangle neighbors. So something funny is, is going to happen. But boundary edges are fine, right? So you can put boundary conditions here and any normal boundary conditions here, any type that you want. And the machinery all works. Um, so like I said, these ma non-manifolds, they're not differentiable. So that strong form that I wrote down on the first page doesn't make any sense. Um, however, I think it's intuitive that the weak form is still well-defined in some sense. I'm not going to try, I'm not even going to attempt to say what that means mathematically. I'll leave that issue up to the experts. But previously and in the rest of this talk, I'm going to, whoops, sorry, I'm going to use this uh, strong form as a kind of a shorthand notation for the variational problem even though it's, this is bad notation, right? And one of, one of the reasons why this is actually bad notation is that it breaks some of your intuition about how solutions of the strong equations work. And in particular, for a strong form, if you have smooth coefficients and smooth boundary conditions, you have some guarantee of smoothness of the solution. And that, that breaks on these uh, non-manifolds. So you can have completely smooth boundary conditions and smooth sources, but across an intersection line, the solution can have a kink. It can have a weak, uh, can be, uh, have a weak discontinuity. And we'll actually see an example of that later. Um, I wanted to put a slide in here about these intersecting rectangle domains because these are, for the application I'm working on, these are important. And also, there's a little plug for GMesh here. The GMesh developers were very nice about helping us get the meshing working on do these domains. Um, what, the, the only disadvantage of GMesh is don't try Dolphin Convert, right? Don't go run home and try Dolphin Convert on a GMesh mesh generated by this because it, it, doesn't, it doesn't work. It squishes out one dimension. So in our project, we've written a, a separate um, GMesh to a Dolphin Converter that circumvents that somehow. And these, these so here's, a, here's an example with some rectangles that were just randomly generated and all our intersections were computed and handed to GMesh. So there's a conforming mesh on this whole thing and a Gaussian source was just put on one of these um, rectangles uh, just as a localized kind of a point-like point source. And you can see how it propagates, um, the solution propagates through the whole network like you think it should. I added this linear term here to the uh, elliptic problem so that I don't have to specify a Dirichlet condition anywhere on this and still get a well-posed problem without having to actually go in there and find an edge and apply a Dirichlet condition to it. Um, one issue that comes up when you consider these randomly generated networks is that it's almost impossible to generate a high-quality conforming mesh um, even for a network which is just a handful of rectangles because you get these glancing uh, collisions all the time where one rectangle will chop off a little corner of another rectangle or two rectangles will meet at a small angle. Um, and in the problem that we're considering, I, I would really would like to look at solutions of equations like this on networks of like thousands of these rectangles. And you end up with lots and lots of low quality elements if you insist on using a conforming mesh. So. Uh, this is kind of a plea for a multi-mesh solution for these kind of um, domains. 
Uh, we all love Mobius strips. Like two years ago, Marie showed a Mobius strip. There was a Mobius strip like four slides ago. So if one Mobius strip is good, then six Mobius strips have to be six times better. <laughs> and again, I, you know, I put this term in there because I don't want to think about how to put a Dirichlet condition on that thing. Um, and the source here actually is the same as used in the, uh, this, whole, this whole configuration fits into like a, a cube a few units across, so this, I use the same source. So it, it's essentially a random, randomly chosen source. You just have to believe that blindly, right? Um, so at this point, you might be convinced that these problems are just, it's just another mesh, right? You don't have to do anything um, to accommodate a non-manifold mesh of this type. I, you know, th here's another example of the same chunk of code that everyone has seen a thousand times. For some reason, it, it uh, I don't know about you guys, but I've written my fair share of Fortran spaghetti code in my life, and this is still thrilling to look at, even since I've been using Phoenix for three years. I, I love it. The, in comparison, the mesh generation code to generate that, this mesh is 200 lines long, just did you get that mesh. Um, Elliptic problems are fine, but let's just, for fun, try something more, more complicated. So this is a, an advection diffusion equation with a nonlinear term here. This is a kind of a hard sphere gas repulsion term. So you can think about this as something like tracer particles being advected through uh, that domain, and the particles occasionally bump into each other. So there's a repulsion that happens between them that forces the concentration of the particles not to be too great at any given point. Um, the, velocity, the advection velocity field here was generated by solving that elliptic equation on the last slide, the one that was just solved on the Mobius strip. And the reason why I did it that way, there's two reasons for that. One is I get a nice uh, vector field which is tangent to the domain everywhere, except at the intersection points where it doesn't make sense that there's a tangent. And also in the form, the nonlinear form that you get when you discretize the time derivative of this using the theta method, I can just write down, I can just put grad phi in that form instead of v. So I never actually have to worry about how to think about the velocity along the intersection lines, because everything is in terms of the velocity potential. And I set the constants here, uh, in particular this constant k and the diffusion coefficient, so this is a diffusion-dominated problem, so I'm not doing anything special to handle the advection part. Um, and I can't vouch for the accuracy of, of that, so. Uh, the, the animation on the next slide is uh, on, the, on that Mobius domain, so the velocity potential has a source and a sink to drive the particles from one side of the domain to the other, and the, the particle source is at the same location as the uh, fluid source, but it doesn't have a sink, but I put a square wave dependence in it. So hopefully this will just run. Do I have to click it? Uh, where's the mouse? Oh, it's not in my hand, okay. All right, so there we go. Um, yeah, so particles are being injected here, and the velocity potential has, has a kink, right, right along this intersection line. So it's because the source is up here, the particles have, uh, the velocity potential is nearly constant along the backside of this Mobius strip, which is why none of this stuff is, ends up back here. It all ends up towards here because there's a path between the source here and the sink up there. So the velocity potential, if you were to graph it just along this strip, is decreasing, 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 and then it decreases in this direction, but it's constant in this direction. So you often get these kinks to very smooth problems. And that's, uh, I had just actually stopped it before the, these particles get to the opposite end, because there's no, there's no sink for the particles, so they all just get bunched up at the, at the top of this Mobius strip at the end, so. Should I run that again? I'll just keep going.
I just want to go to the next one. Um, another, th another thing that requires absolutely no work on my part is that everything just works in parallel. Um, in particular, the mesh refinement, this plaza refinement that Chris implemented works on these domains automatically. You can actually take a point along the intersection line and say, I want to just refine around that point and it will, will refine all the sub-manifolds equally around that point. Um, so here's an example where uh, we ran a, a problem consisting of 2,500 of these intersecting rectangles on Cray XC30, um, a Department of Energy Cray. So this is a, on Cray standards, this is a pretty small problem. It has only 100 million degrees of freedom, uh, quadratic elements, and the solver was PETC, with GM resin hyper preconditioning. Um, Almost, I was very surprised by this, almost perfect parallel efficiency up to a thousand processes um, for this uh, mesh. So, of course, a thousand processes on this, on this cray is just one little corner of one box in, in a room somewhere. It's not, it's not a lot, but this kind of scaling is, uh, was unexpected for me. The only funny thing is the mesh partitioning is a bit strange, so I sit down with Chris and work that out. But even though the, the mesh is partitioned among the processes in a, in a way that I wasn't expecting, it doesn't seem to interfere with the scaling. All right. This is my stab at uh, graph theory. So edge-weighted edge graphs are kind of like a one-dimensional version of these things. Um, the difference between graphs and the non-manifolds that we are just talking about is that graphs, graphs don't need an embedding in a higher space because they don't have any geometry. So structure preserving maps are not required. Um, so if you interpret the graph, the edge weight as a distance, right, now you have a bunch of one dimensional domains that are all hooked up at the vertices. And for display purposes only, I arrange the vertices around this unit circle, but they actually can be anywhere in the plane. And this is what is called a unit distance graph, which means the edge weights are all one. So in the code, there is a actual discontinuous coefficient in front of this u-squared term that takes into account the change in the, the geometric length of this line. So that essentially I've scaled out the length for um, each uh, subdomain, if you want to call it that. So what's missing from this equation is a, a, a discontinuous coefficient that's right in front of here that scales everything out. So this is a unit distance graph. And, um, the solution here is I just put a Dirichlet condition at one graph vertex and uh, computed that. You might be curious as to why that even works. I used only one boundary condition. It was fine. There's an explanation for that. And I generated a lot of these graphs over the weekend. And here's my little, my super silly graph theory conjecture that if you solve this equation on, this, on a graph and the minimum of u is greater than zero, that implies the graph has one component. If it is equal to zero, then it has more than one component. So that's a relationship between a PDE, PDE properties on a graph and the graph's topological properties. All right, so just to summarize, uh, variational problems on these types of non-manifold domains are, in fact, not, not a problem at all. Phoenix already handles them out of the box, so to speak. Many applications um, naturally generate such domains. Anything involving wires or pipes or channels or interfaces, um, you'll get domains like this. Um, for, in particular, for randomly generated uh, rectangular do domains like ours, mesh generation is really an issue. Um, and I did some literature searching, and I did find a few examples sprinkled throughout the literature of similar simula simulations. So I'm not, I'm not, I can't claim any of this is entirely new. Right? And again, it's just a future work. Uh, this is just a, a bald plea for a, a multi-mesh uh, solution for these domains. Um, my, honestly, my heartfelt thanks to the other Manifold developers, Colin Cotter, David Hamm, and Andrew McRae. Um, you made me look really uh, smart at work. Uh, Chris, 
Chris uh, and my colleague at Maliar Lin Nguyen were essential for getting the C++ versions of these simulations uh, running on the NERSC Cray. Uh, Cray was uh, the Department of Energy generously gave us some time. Um, and of course, Maria is uh, at Simula. That's it. Thank you. Um, yeah, I'll take I'll take a shot of that. Okay. Yeah. No, um, I'm just saying the automatic mesh partitioner. If you use actually, if you use any of the partitioners that Dolphin has access to, um, Parmidis or Scotch or any of the other ones, you you get a partitioning which. Um, is unusual looking. It's not what I expected. I can. I have pictures of it. I'll show it to you. Okay. Yeah. But it was done automatically. It was done automatically. Yeah. Strange. Right. Yeah. I think it's diffusion dominated. But just curious if you say you DG or something, how would you Yes. Yeah. Oh, he's talking. He said there's there's a lot of work on Laplacians on graphs, right? So here I'm just solving a Laplacian with a nonlinear term on a graph. But I guess what I'm suggesting is that we're not restricted to Laplacians, right? So. I'm, I'm happy with those weak discontinuities at the intersections. I actually think they make sense. So I'm not sure there's actually a, like a physics problem there. <laughs> 